The Sabbat. If you're watching this video, you're probably here to listen to my critical review of this. Well, if you listen long enough, you'll get an earful, I promise. But listening to me bitch and moan for six minutes isn't fair to you, loyal viewer. Now, I typically have a pretty standard format for my reviews, but you won't be getting that today. Nope, no cool backgrounds, no fun stock footage, no Professor Power Gamer to bring some levity. In fact, I'm just gonna give you my final score and my recap up front. My score for Sabat the Black Hand is one dot out of five. If V5 is your only experience with the Sabat and you storytell for your group, you might find something of value in this book. However, if you've ever had even a passing fondness for exploring the character complexities of the eviler vampires, this book is likely to leave you with ashes in your mouth. All vampires, even in the camera are monsters. Exploring how they lean into or ignore their humanity in the face of evil is kind of the whole fucking point of this game. The book is, at best, confusing and frequently contradictory, and describes a less compelling sect than those found in earlier versions. The sect, as presented in V5, introduces a bunch of retroactive continuity and turns a vile, though nuanced group of vampires into one-dimensional baddies you can feel good about sending your players against. Anyway, on to what this book is, and what it definitely isn't. The Sabbat, which has been available to players since the early 90s, are no longer a playable option. Instead, they're presented here as bad guys for the game. Quote, The function of the Sabbat in Vampire the Masquerade stories is to threaten the status quo. The presentation of the Sabbat for the fifth edition of Vampire is as antagonists. If V5 is your first and only interaction with the world of darkness, congrats! Here's some psycho red shirts for your anarch slash cam slash thin blood characters to fight. Line them up and knock them back. But beware, this book is not a player resource. Anyone claiming it is, even remotely intended for player characters, is blowing smoke right up your ass. And I gotta tell you, even if they were playable, this isn't the Sabbat you knew. Very deliberately, most of the actual history of the sect has been ignored or retconned wholesale. The Sabbat of V5 are presented, matter-of-factly, as evil, disorganized, utterly inhumane vampire supremacists, a term deliberately chosen and repeated ad nauseum by the writers to emphasize their unredeemable nature, lacking an individual identity, ambition, and autonomy. They've basically been reduced to the Reavers of the World of Darkness. Reavers. The varied factions, ideologies, clan identities, domains, internal power structure, and many of the rituals and rites. Diverse packmates with varied ideals bound together toward a singular goal through Valdery and Rite are gone. All we're left with are the smoldering remains of a pseudo-sect. Bloodthirsty monsters without a home, assembling on the front lines of some vague Gehenna war. A war being fought... Well, it's in the, <coughs> it's in the Middle East. It's, it's uh, right. somewhere. But also, the war is happening everywhere. Hey, you know what? You figure it out. The writers don't have to write about the world you're playing in. Shut the fuck up! Chapter 1 sets the tone for the entire book. Leaving behind much of the world building of the previous three editions, the creative team sought to take us back to the halcyon days of the first edition. You know, the best edition. Sarcasm. Back when the Sabbat were simply a mysterious death cult and old vampires couldn't die unless they wanted to. If you read this chapter and much of the rest of the book with honest eyes, you'll find several contradictions, especially when it comes to the concept of domain. On one hand, all the major Sabbat domains are empty or mostly bereft of canine presence. On the other hand, the Black Hand needs its warfront domains to continue providing grist for its innumerable conflicts. But at the same time, it needs readouts to which to fall back and enjoy what blood-streaked freedom it can say to have won for itself. Wait, what? A priest or bishop will declare that the time has come for a crusade. In this context, crusade refers to an all-out attack that is preceded by a massive surge on shovelhead parties to provide as many shock troops as possible for the final battle. If the crusade succeeds, those neonates who survive and earn the status of true sabbat rarely stay in the conquered territory. Most pursue the momentum and strike out for the front lines of the Gehenna War. 
Okay, so I'm confused. You topple a domain and I guess you kill all the vampires there? Then you just leave and go to the land of Narnia to fight the antediluvians? But wait, there's more! Although the Sabbat cares little for the notion of domain the way the other sects do, it nonetheless sees a value in maintaining various territories for the sake of recruitment and strategic fallback points. As well, each city claimed and held is one that the toadies of the other sects can't have for their own, which is its own reward. <sighs> Juh. What, like the fucking massive domains you somehow left en masse? The Sabbat had domains. What fucking sense does it make from any rational or irrational vampire perspective to pack your bags, leave all your cities, and go try to take new ones when you had all your own to begin with? Here's another massive contradiction in a single sentence. Although Sabbat titles and ranks have become informal against the backdrop of the Gehenna War, and in the era of the Second Inquisition, waging a war requires a unified chain of command and soldiers that know their place. Five and six, twelve. So is it informal or is it unified? Is it a rudderless ship or an organized army with soldiers that know their place? And what is an informal army? Oh, come on, that sounds awesome. Uh, how do you direct a vampiric suicide cult to travel across the fucking planet without, like, a formal leader? It's almost as if the writers just didn't communicate about what was being written, or, alternatively, they didn't care enough to think it through. Okay, since we're going off on a rant here, can we just address the fact that the Black Hand is a subsect of the Sabbat? A highly trained paramilitary subsect that held the Sabbat together through civil wars and massive upheavals. And there's no mention of that anywhere. Chapter 2, Paths of Enlightenment. Yeah, so where to begin? Uh, every one of the remaining Paths of Enlightenment have been rewritten to remove virtually all aspects that espoused restraint or nuance. Every path, and I mean every path, has been rendered to its most violent and reprehensible logical conclusion. Example, where once a nodist on the path of Cain might take the vitae of the unworthy so they may become closer to Cain, while tempering this with an understanding of their own potential so as not to take the curse for granted, the new nodists lower one's generation and concentrate the power of one's blood to become closer to Cain and exalt in the potency it yields. It's in these subtle changes of language that the World of Darkness team has removed all forms of temperance leaving the paths and the sect as a whole ill-suited for play. Furthermore, the more humane paths, and I use that term loosely, are utterly forsaken or relegated to what is now called Legacy World of Darkness. For those of you not familiar with corporate doublespeak, that means all World of Darkness before V5. And this begs the question, why even include a mention of these paths, like Honorable Accord or Path of the Beast? My number one issue with this chapter isn't how much they changed the things I like into something I don't like. No, it's how completely redundant and unnecessary much of the information is when presenting the Sabbat as antagonists. Wait, Nate, what do you mean? Well, how much time do we figure our Anarch protagonists are going to be spending with the Sabbat in casual conversation? Are your players likely to hunt down a Sabbat pack only to have a friendly dialogue about the motives behind their savage rash of murders? Do you think in your very intelligent brain that your players are going to ever care which of the four paths affected the Sabbat vampire's behavior? Oh, ever so slightly. And then they go on and on and on and on and on about the paths. The ethics, the favorite disciplines, the new symbols for pins and t-shirts and other assorted commercial purposes, and how to portray these paths for each of the three new video game-like modes, Vanguard, Siege, and Dominion. And yet none of this is for player consumption. So you, the storyteller, will have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the Sabbat Paths and basically everything else in this book. A great example of this is the inclusion of disciplines at the end of the chapter. Honestly, I can't see the point in having like eight extra disciplines and a handful of rituals tacked onto this book. How long before your players want these disciplines for their characters? Another example of too much non-actionable information is the sect Octoritas Rite also jammed into chapter two. And why, oh God, why bother to include things that will never play a role in a game? 
One of the most eye twitch moments for me was this. In extreme cases, players' characters may actually participate in a monomacy, willing or otherwise, if some situation occurs by which the Sabbat have cause to challenge them. No! No, they won't. Are you fucking high? For the uninitiated, monomacy is a sacred duel the sect used to settle grievances. Typically fought to the death, it's how ranking Sabbat settle differences when all other options have failed. Monomacy is a sacrosanct ritual used to cull incompetent leadership and strengthen the sect. Why would the Sabbat challenge non-Sabbat to monomacy? The Sabbat, the evil mindless murder cult you've painted, would just kill them. Oh, and uh, so would every other version of the Sabbat. Chapter 3 fills us with more intricate details about the hot and cold warfare of the Sabbat. On one hand, the Sabbat fight a hot war on the front line of the GW, which are apparently happening in uh, the Middle East and Russia and South America and other vague places that are never given any additional detail, save for single-page in-game narratives, which, as an aside, would piss me off if I were a player living in any of these geographies. What, there's cool world-ending shit happening in my backyard and I don't even get to know about it? Oh, okay, I, I got it. I guess if you want to play the game the right way, you can only do it in North American and Western European settings. Cool, guys. I mean, maybe I'm reading into it too much. Okay, got it. So big scary wars are happening in parts of the world the writers don't want to write about, but we also learn in Chapter 3 that the Sabbat are infiltrating and subverting uh, everywhere else. But they don't subvert these Camarilla Anarch and Ashura domains to take them over. Or, wait... Do they? Packs may move back and forth, to and from the front, and may switch modalities any number of times, and it's all incomprehensible to anyone not of the sect, which is why the Sabbat seems to have a hive mentality to outside onlookers. No one else reliably knows how to divine what they're doing or how they're fighting the war. Yeah, uh, neither do we. I don't know, maybe that was the point. The next eye twitch moment for me is on page 74. Where members of the other sects may consider themselves in terms of clan, Sabbat members almost always consider themselves vampires first, Sabbat second, and followers of their own particular path third. Clan almost never matters to their self-image. On those rare occasions when lineage comes into question, Sabbat append the word anti-tribute when they name clans, acknowledging the limited extent of its importance. For example, Archbishop Lucida of Madrid is La Sombra anti-tribute, and Sasha Vicos, the martyr of Cain, is Zemis anti-tribute. Ah, oh, this, my friends, is retroactive continuity at its laziest. Retroactive continuity, commonly known as retcon, is the deliberate changing of previously established facts in a work of serial fiction. This single page utterly contradicts every previous edition of the game. Whole bloodlines have been rendered null. It's crazy that this drastic of a change was allowed, and frankly, it's just bad writing on the part of the authors. Ultimately, what pisses me off about this book and a whole host of V5 material isn't that I don't like the direction they've taken with the story or that it's different than earlier editions or that some stuff hasn't been included in the new edition. It isn't even the fact that the Onyx Path material and the other White Wolf slash Modifius slash World of Darkness developed stuff feels like a totally different game. No. What irritates the living shit out of me as a longtime player is that V5 is obviously a reboot, soft or otherwise, but the developers adamantly claim that it isn't. I'm sorry that Byzantine lore pushed some folks away from Vampire. I get it. It's complicated and there's a lot of it. And some of it, in retrospect, is pretty garbage. I understand that the developers want to tell stories focused on humanity and that the Sabbat doesn't fit into their view of what that entails. So it seems to me there are two effective options for how to deal with such a complex world. One, you write story to explain these massive sweeping changes you made to the lore. You write stories that make sense. You write good stories for your storytelling game and remain true to the world people before you, and in some cases, you yourself have established. Or two, you reboot the world. You keep everything that you think helps define the world and discard everything that doesn't. All the old characters can get a new polish or find their way to the ash heap. However, the world of darkness, paradox, and the various creative teams have chosen a third option. They've essentially rebooted the game, both from a rules and story perspective, but they keep insisting that they haven't. They've painted canon, metaplot, lore, 
as if it's some barrier for entry or something arbitrary and meaningless to the core of gameplay. And you know what? It's their product to do with as they choose. In fact, Twitter, Discord, and most other social media spaces are resounding in the glory of these choices. But while backslapping echo chambers are great for the ego, they don't turn bad books into good books. And they certainly don't make confusing, contradictory, redundant, poorly laid out books worth 45 bucks. Hi, are you tired? Did you know that I think you're the cutest boy in the whole entire world? You're sleepy. Are you sleepy? 